If you have a public audience comment form, please submit it now before 5 p.m. Okay. Okay. It is 5 p.m. on Monday, October 9th, 2023. This is a regular board meeting for the Monroe School District. Present are myself, President Bumpus, Director Barnes, Director Campbell, Director Whitfield, Student Representatives Laura Wittenberg and Sophia Willett, Superintendent Sean Woodward, District Leadership Team and School District staff, as well as members of the community. Director Etzcorn will not be in attendance this evening. Members of the public can log into the regular board meeting using the Zoom, Zoom link attached to tonight's agenda that is found on board doc's website. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to tonight's meeting. We are so happy to have you join us. All comments during tonight's meeting are audio recorded and will be available online on our website. This is in addition to the written minutes. Please understand that while it may appear the board is moving quickly on important matters, there have been previous discussions on these issues either in earlier meetings or in board workshops, which are also open public meetings. Each director has had ample time to study the issues, ask appropriate questions and obtain satisfactory answers from the superintendent, his staff, or through outside research. Those wishing to address the board during public comments must turn in a public comment form prior to the start of the meeting at five. Any form submitted after the meeting has started will be held for the next meeting to address the board at that time. Moving on to agenda item 2.04, is there a motion to approve the agenda? I move that the Monroe School District Board of Directors approves the agenda dated October 9, 2023. Is there a second? Second. There is a motion and a second to approve the agenda uh, dated October 9, 2023. All in favor, raise your hand. The agenda item has passed four to zero. Moving on to agenda item 3.01, accreditation, accredit, accreditation Educational Service District. We have the Northwest Educational Service District with Superintendent Larry Francois to present the accreditation plaque to Monroe High School. <laughs> Thank you, uh, President Bumpus and the rest of the Monroe Board, Superintendent Woodward. Uh, I'm Larry Francois, I'm Superintendent of the Northwest Educational Service District, and I'm here tonight to recognize uh, Brett Willey and Monroe High School for their status as a renewed AESD uh, accredited high school. So um, just a little bit about ESD. So we are one of nine ESDs uh, statewide. Um, the history of ESDs goes back in this state to um, before statehood, when there were county offices of education that kind of ran all the administrative affairs for school districts. And then over decades and decades of consolidation, we've, we've whittled down to the nine regional ESDs we have now. The Northwest ESD encompasses the five county region of uh, Snohomish, Skagit, Whatcom Island, and San Juan counties, and the 35 school districts, and tribal compact schools, and private schools within that region. Uh, our ESD is um, similar to a school district governed by a board of directors. However, different than a school district, you are actually the electors for our nine board members. So um, hopefully you have some familiarity with a ballot you should have received from WASDA sometime earlier this month. Uh, and we have four directors that are, four of our nine directors that are up for re-election this year. Uh, collectively, the nine ESDs um, form what's called the Association of Educational Service Districts. And so while ESDs primarily are responsive to the needs within their particular region as the AESD, uh, we come together to provide statewide services and accreditation is one of the statewide services that we provide. The Northwest ESD is the head ESD for accreditation, but it is again a service that's available anywhere across Washington state. Uh, we accredit, we are the largest accrediting body in Washington state of high schools and we accredit all kinds of high schools, comprehensive high schools like Monroe, alternative high schools, themed high schools, private high schools, charter high schools. Um, so what is accreditation? So 
way back, many, many moons ago when I began my career, accreditation was a required process. It was primarily intended to satisfy for higher ed institutions that students were coming from uh, high schools that met rigorous standards. At the time, um, you might question some of the metrics that they used. What were the qualifications of the teachers? Always important, but maybe not completely determinate. How many books were there in the library? What was the square, square footage of the gym? Things like that, that um, might have said some things about your school, but didn't necessarily, in my mind, directly equate to the kind of instructional experience that students were receiving. Over the last couple of decades, accreditation has changed from a uh, required process to a voluntary process. And so um, districts still, and we still encourage schools to participate in accreditation. There are um, many reasons why, even though colleges don't necessarily require students to come from accredited high schools, there are still some unique situations out there where opportunities might be closed to students by not being from an accredited high school. Um, the primary purpose of accreditation uh, is to provide an external view of a school's um, quality. And in the current age, for the last couple of decades, accreditation has really been a facilitated school improvement planning process. So we work with a series of, of accreditation coaches. Um, they are typically retired administrators or high school principals. And then they work side by side with the principal over the course of a year, uh, reviewing the school's data, involving constituent groups from across um, the school and the community and building the school school improvement plan. Uh, the process is a six, six step cycle of inquiry process and it's grounded in four foundational uh, elements. The uh, school improvement plan has to be data driven. It has to be student achievement focused, research based foundation and actions, and it has to be collaboratively determined. So it has to involve staff, students, parents, community, it can't just be an administratively driven process. Once schools are approved for accreditation or reapproved in the case of Monroe, accreditation is good for a six year period. And then three years into the accreditation cycle, we'll do a check in with Brett and Monroe High School and see the progress that they're making on their school improvement plan, celebrate the progress that they've made and chat with them about any revisions they're making based on circumstances that have changed over that time. So tonight here to recognize uh, Monroe High School and present to them uh, this plaque, um, noting them as an AESD accredited high school for the 2023 to 2029 period. We hope Brett that you'll find a important and prominent place to display this at your school. Uh, we've also provided the school with an electronic logo, noting them as an AESD accredited school. And we hope you'll find places on your website in your newsletters or others to make that known. I don't think John Q. Public knows um, what accreditation necessarily means, but I think given the choice between sending your, your kids to an accredited or a non-accredited high school, most people would pick an accredited high school because they think that means something. And we believe our, our process does uh, put a stamp of quality on the instructional program and the thoughtfulness with which they're working on their improvement efforts. So congratulations and thank you for a few minutes on your agenda tonight. I'll just, uh, just a couple quick comments. This was one of the most helpful, it was a lot of work, but it was a really helpful process, um, which I don't think a lot of people say that about accreditation processes, but the way our ESD has structured it, it was, it was phenomenal. Um, just so much feedback and input. Um, and then at the end, really helping us land on what we're working on this year and beyond. So it really was a, a great process. I'm glad we took it serious and didn't look at it as a checkbox, but Really enjoyed enjoyed uh, working with Larry and his team on on that. So thank you. Thank you, Brett and Larry. Okay, moving on to agenda item four point zero one: consideration of grants and or loans. Or sorry, donations. Okay, tonight we have a couple. I'm going to go ahead and read these ones off. We have a grocery outlet who's donated a monetary grant in the amount of $150 for the sole and express purpose of the Academy of Critical Thinking for Sky Valley Education Center. We have Michelle Knudsen uh, who donated a monetary grant in the amount of $1,056.30 for the sole and express purchase of purchasing a Salem Woods Elementary Buddy Bench. That sounds amazing. Uh, we have a Bearcat Pride 
that donated a monetary grant in the amount of $500 for the sole and express purpose of Mr. Brett Willie spending how he sees fit. It's a principal basket. Uh, and then we also have Bearcat Pride that donated a monetary grant in the amount of $375 for the sole and express purpose of concessions volunteer payout. So a huge thank you to those in our community who continue to partner with us in the education of our students. We thank you so very much. Thank you, Director Barnes. Agenda item 4.02, student representative reports. Our student representatives will present a report highlighting student activities throughout the district. Sophia or Laura? Okay. okay. So there's a lot going on at Sky Valley, like always. Um, this, move it closer. A lot going on at Sky Valley, as always. Um, this Wednesday, October 11th, we have our first once a month Wednesday family potluck. So that should be fun. I think that's a fundraiser for STEM, but I'm not sure. And then um, every other Thursday, starting October 12th, which is this Thursday, we have partnering workshops for parents. And then October 14th, which is a Saturday, we have a campus cleanup event, which is put on by the Gardening and Grounds Committee. And then October 27th, we have the Harvest Dance, and then a Snow Owl Information Session, October 31st. And then the Academy of Critical Thinking Chili Fundraiser is Wednesday, October 18th, and you can wear your flannel for a free treat. And then um, we have Never mind, that was my last thing. Um, any questions? <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Hi. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, um, I would like to say that this year's felt a lot calmer, the start of it, because the last couple of years, it's felt kind of hectic, but it feels like things are going well and some new rules were set down for the high school, but it feels like they're working and a lot more like kids in my class at least are showing up. And then everyone's just really excited for homecoming. Um, like everybody's talking about it and uh, it just feels good. Good year to start. Any questions? I have a question. Uh, how can we as a board or just individuals as a board, uh, better support you um, as a student representative of the board? You can think about it. You wanna think about it? Okay, we'll think about it. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much for your reports. Okay, moving on to agenda item 4.03. We have public comment. We welcome and value public comment on educational issues and recognize the importance of the opportunity for members of the public to express their thoughts to the school board. It is the policy of the Monroe School District to promote mutual respect, civility, and orderly conduct among district employees, parents, and the public. We kindly ask that you refrain from comments that violate, violate school district policy. Individuals are asked to limit comments to three minutes. A designated speaker for a group is asked to keep comments to five minutes. If you have a personnel concern, any staff member in the room can help with how to go forward with a complaint about personnel. The board does not respond to public comments during the business meeting. Please know that the board's silence is neutral. It is neither a signal of agreement nor disagreement with the speaker's remarks. The president may interrupt or terminate an individual's statement when it is personally directed, abusive, obscene, irrelevant, targets a protected class, or exceeds the time limit. As the board president, I will determine the appropriateness of all such things, all such rulings, excuse me. When I call your name, please step up to the microphone. If attending the meeting virtually, please join us as a panelist, allow video and unmute your microphone. Our first speaker is Katie. Okay, hey, Miss Katie, can I please have you state your name and your relationship to the school district? Katie Woods, I am a community member and business leader. 
And then can you not start the three minutes? Cause I want to respect the three minute limit and I'm going to read this, but I just want to make sure you know that I'm not going to use any um, names. I'm just talking about a process. So I'm here to talk about facility requests. So that's it. You can start the timer. I'm here today to talk about the process to rent a facility in this district, especially this room. Um, I was going to come last year, but I thought that maybe it was just, a, I was learning the process and it was a one-off, except for this year, it was a much more challenging process. On July 10th, I filled out the school dude request form um, for an event that I want to have on November 8th. This is an educational event for business owners, and I did not get a confirmation response after filling out the request. On August 17th, I still had no confirmation, so I sent an email to the two people that helped me last year. One person responded, and the response was, I've transitioned to a new position in the district and no longer manage facility use requests. Blank is our, our new facility use specialist and will be back in the office on August 21st. I didn't hear back, so I sent a follow-up email to this person on August 31st, asking if you could confirm that I have reserved the room so I can start planning the event. The response I received on September 6th was, I was off during the summer and I'm currently working on the rest of September as the beginning of the school year is quite busy. I do see re your request and I will get started on November dates closer to the end of the month. You can, con you can continue checking in. So I sent a response the same day that said, can you please confirm if I have this date confirmed? I need to get everything lined up, including catering, invitations, speakers, advertising, et cetera, because there's over 100 people I, that I want to come. I requested the date in July. We are getting close to the event date and I need to get everything organized. I didn't get any kind of response back. I reached out to others in the district office to see if they could help me. All they could tell me is there was nothing on the calendar for that date. On September 28th, I sent an additional email. I haven't heard anything back. Can you please confirm I have the boardroom reserved for the Monroe Business Symposium on November 8th? No response. On October 3rd, I sent an additional email and I, that I haven't received confirmation and my event is a month out. I called a few people in the district that I knew could try to help me and finally received an email back from the supervisor. Mind you, this person I emailed in August with no response. I finally got a response in October. And the response was, thanks for reaching out about your event. I checked with Blank and they're working on your request and should be in touch soon. So, and if you don't hear back by a certain date, please, let me, please send me another email. So finally on the third, I received the contract for the event. Last year, I had the same issue and I stopped by the district office, went to the front desk and I just asked, can you let me know if I have the room reserved for my event? The person at the desk said, this is not my job and did not help me with finding a person to tell me, didn't leave a message, didn't tell me who I needed to contact. It was just, this is not my job. And this is something I hear a lot, which is not acceptable. I bring this up because this is not a usual, an, an unusual occurrence, but it seems to be the norm when you ask others in our community. We're having sports teams go to other communities because they can't use our fields, or it's just too difficult to get them to be reserved. I can say from firsthand experience as a former school board member, I spent hundreds of hours reaching out to our community members to get the bond passed to build our fields and our facilities. It should not be this difficult to reserve space or to be used by people that are paying for it with their tax dollars. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Shauna? I'll try not to talk too loud. I don't usually need a microphone. My name is Shauna Andrew. Um, I have three children that graduated from Sky Valley, and I'm also a teacher at Sky Valley, and I've been there for over 21 years total as a parent and a teacher. So first I want to talk about, ironically, field use. Um, we have not been able to use the field across from our school for a very first years. First, we were put off by the agenda for low income housing, which is a great thing. We need more housing. But so everybody stopped taking care of the field. And, you know, uh, Sky Valley is always kind of the, the redheaded stepchild. Everybody forgets us. And um, we have 
we have team sports. We don't have a field. Last week, we had a community member that said, hey, it sure would be nice to have a field to walk on. So we have this green space that because the district felt like it was going to make money off of it, just stopped taking care of it. We used to take kids out there. Uh, I get a high number of very active children that take my classes. And there were some days where if they just could not focus, we would go walk the track and talk about what we were talking about so they could move. And um, it was nice seeing sports teams from the community be able to use it. So it sure would be nice to not get lost um, in all of the agendas and maybe have our field back. And I think the community would appreciate that as well. Hopefully we'll be able to build on it someday and upgrade possibly our school. But unless one of us wins the Powerball tonight, I don't see that happening anytime soon. It would be nice to have our field back. Um, second thing, um, which is kind of funny because I just kind of complained, but I also want to talk about on Facebook and during comments, we saw see a lot about uh, toxic positivity from the school board. Well, I want to say that um, I do appreciate the positive take that, that y'all have. Um, it doesn't mean that there aren't things that we need to work on, but I, for one, am glad to see the good things that are happening in the school district. And um, I just want y'all to know that I do appreciate that because we all know scientifically it's good to think positively. Um, we need, we're teaching our kids social emotional skills. And then as adults, we all get on Facebook and complain. So I, for one, am glad to have the positive along with the negative. And I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you, Shauna. Cass? Hi. Hey Cass, name and relationship to the school district. I got it. My name is Cass Gleason. My pronouns are she, they. I am a parent of Sky Valley Kids and one of the parent advisors for the Sky Valley QSA, the Queer Straight Alliance, and I stand before you as a concerned parent. My hope in speaking today is to help shine a different light on ideas and what it can look like to those directly affected. I put before you the board consideration looking at intent versus impact with the proposed kindness campaign. No one will deny kindness. I'm not going to deny kindness. But I want you to consider how it affects those who have been and are being constantly attacked and bullied when someone comes in saying, just be kind to one another and proposes painting rocks and writing happy things on paper. It feels like a slap in the face to them, to all of us affected. This is a form Sorry, of toxic positivity. <laughs> I'm all for positivity and thinking happy, but I also have to say that we have to point out certain things as well. We cannot cover up what is actually happening in this district with a distraction such as a kindness campaign. We need to call out and say what is really happening. Call it what it is. Bullying, racism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism. I also think it's important for people to understand why the kindness campaign even started in Sky Valley last year. It wasn't just a fun idea. It was because of me. I found hate speech in the teen area in November. And it was not handled well by administration. I had a meeting with them and their answer was a kindness campaign. Not saying what had happened and finding a way to address the hate, but a sugar-coated campaign. It made my QSA kids feel worse and as if they didn't matter at all. It made them feel unsafe. I feel like it was a way to quiet me. And when I asked the difficult question of how are we going to make it impactful for our sixth to 12th graders to change behavior and keep every child safe, I was shut down. I could not be a part of something that refused to address the actual issues at hand. The campaign, in my opinion, was not a success. We struggled the rest of the year with incidences and we started our year this year with two hate speech incidences in the first two weeks. And the only reason it was even being addressed is because we finally got a counselor who is going into the classroom to educate students on bullying and what our expectations at Sky Valley are. This should have happened last year in November. So let me put it to you, my board. What are you going to do to achieve the biggest impact with six to 12th graders that they actually get a hold on the bullying, racism, homophobia, transphobia, and ableism that is actually happening in our district? 
Because until we truly make all children safe, all children valued, all children seen, and all children heard, then everything else is just performative. So I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Cass. Okay, agenda item 5.01. Is there a motion? I move that the Monroe School District Board of Directors accept the donation received. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second that the Monroe School District Board of Directors accepts the donation received. Discussion? This is for the donation received was from Denise Crump, donated five boxes of various, various machinist tooling with a value of $5,000 to the Monroe High School Advanced Manufacturing Learning slash AML CTE department. Thank you. That's a great thing to put in our discussion. Yes, That's amazing. Yes, yes. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Denise. Okay. All in favor, raise your hand. The agenda item has passed four to zero. Moving on to agenda item 6.05, approval of the consent agenda. Is there a motion? I move that the Monroe School District Board of Directors approve all items as listed and presented in the consent agenda dated October 9, 2023. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second that the Monroe School District Board of Directors approve all items as listed and presented in the consent agenda dated October 9th, 2023. All in favor, raise your hand. The agenda item has passed four to zero. Moving on to agenda item 7.01, superintendent update. All righty. Good evening, everyone. Um, I have just four items to hit tonight. Um, and I think these are items that I'll come back to throughout the course of the year, probably every four to six weeks or so, uh, because they happen to be big emphasis areas of us this year and, and moving forward as well. Uh, one, of, one of them is attendance. Talk a little bit about, about attendance this evening. Uh, a quick learning update, as well as an update uh, in the area of student belonging and what we're doing as a system to uh, make sure that we're increasing a sense of belonging uh, when it comes to all of our students. Um, I'd like to start with a, a snapshot of our enrollment at, at this point though. So we'll start there. Good news is if you look at the very bottom numbers, um, the projected enrollment was, and that's how we set our, our budget obviously, was 5,357 students. As the month uh, went on past the, the, the first snapshot, which was the fifth day of school, we have gained students. So that's, that's great news and that's pretty typical for the month of October. So we're getting our, our enrollment is currently pretty close to what we projected. Uh, the first column there is how we ended last year. So we are close to where we ended last year uh, as well. There are some interesting uh, trends though, as you will see, um, we had a pretty big drop at Frank Wagner uh, Elementary School. Uh, that a big portion of those students were at the kindergarten level. So we collapsed one of those classrooms as you, as you remember. We have a pretty big increase at Salem Woods. However, that was that was projected uh, there. Uh, both of our middle schools, um, Park Place is right in line with, with projected and that's because we had a lot of eighth grade students leaving and then a smaller six, sixth grade class coming in. Uh, Hidden R River was quite a bit lower than projections. And then you can see uh, our, our biggest uh, growth area was our at uh, Sky Valley Education Center. So, about uh, 60 students or so above uh, projections. So uh, it'll be interesting to hear from the Sky Valley folks. And uh, one question that I have, haven't asked Karen yet, uh, I'm very curious about, you know, where are these students coming from? Are they mostly in district transfers or are they coming from outside of the district? Uh, Karen's uh, most recent estimate when it comes to out of district students, about 52% of our students in that, uh, at that school come from out of district. Um, I've heard a lot of uh, different numbers since I've arrived. There's, there's a perception that it's closer to 70 to 80%. I've heard that several times since you mentioned it to me, Jeremiah, but it's about, about roughly half of our students come from, from outside. Uh, a reminder uh, with that, is that the, the dollars follow those students. So the FTE uh, that we, the apportionment that we receive from the state comes to the Monroe School District with that. So any questions about enrollment? 
one quick question mm -hmm. about Salem Woods. Is the uptick in those students partially because of the high cap program that we have there as well? Is it, is it new there this year? Is I'm it this not year sure. that's the first year that they have it there? No, they've had that in the previous years. Okay. I was wondering about that because I know we have some students who were going from other buildings to there for that. I didn't know if that was part of it. And then also, do we have any understanding that just, I don't know if it's graduation or whatever, but there's a big drop, especially proportionally for leaders in learning. I, yeah, what, what, what I'm guessing is will happen there, uh, which is a fairly common at the high school level is as the year progresses, uh, there'll be students that shift over from Monroe High School into, into leaders. Uh, that would not be surprising. All right, moving on to attendance, I believe, or no, sorry, we are on student learning. Was there an attendance slide before that? Yes, okay, so so all good. Um, one of our other goal areas this year is just to right the ship, if you will, when it comes to student attendance. Uh, our district is much like the rest of the state and the US, post-pandemic uh, attendance in schools has been challenging. Uh, there's far more chronic absenteeism uh, across the state and, and we fit right into that category. Next or in two weeks, uh, we'll be showing all of our overall attendance data over the last couple of years. But uh, chronic absenteeism is a, as big of a problem as it's ever been here. And how that's defined at the state level is uh, students who miss 18 or more school days uh, during the uh, course of a school year, which is about two or so absences per month on average. Um, I'll bring some data back in a couple of weeks on, on that. I think we're right around, um, I wanna say 35% of our students fall into that category as of, as of last year. So we're gonna track it every month and start working on some systems that we think can help uh, our students and their families. The attendance rate that you see up here tonight, that's just simply, uh, percentage of days attended versus percent versus number of days possible. So you can see we're generally speaking in the in the 90% range. Uh, we'll just add a column once a month so you can see how we're doing. It's an interesting metric because for when it comes to student learning, we don't have consistent metrics every month. We don't have that kind of an assessment system. We can track attendance very closely. So it'll be uh, interesting to see if we can move the needle in the positive direction here. We are, I'm gonna meet with the principal group tomorrow, looking at taking a district level resource. We had somebody leave the district. We're looking at taking that resource and pushing the resource to the building level. Uh, we think that we can make some positive movement just by really some of the systems that we have in place. If, if we're working from the school versus outside of the school with our families, we think that that will be helpful. So uh, more to come on, on on that shift and at the next meeting. Any questions about attendance? The question, did you say 35% or 35 students were, um, were a part of that, that high absenteeism? 35%, so that would be 35% of our students last year missed 18 days or more of school. And that's the, again, that's how OSPI defines chronic absenteeism. Yeah, pretty high, right? I think it's right around what the state average is. We are, I think we're closer, and again, don't quote me on this, although it's on the video, so you will, but uh, I think we're usually closer to 80 to 82% pre-pandemic, and that was true of the state as well. So obviously, there's a big drop during the pandemic as far as a lot of absentee ism due to the COVID requirements, et cetera. But um, uh, last year, you know, statewide, it was, it was a similar picture. Sean, with the 35%, the are those, do you know if that is excused absences or unexcused absences or any kind of absence? Any kind of absence, yeah. So if a student is sick as well, just with all the extra measures we've been taking in the last few years, that could be part of it as well. Exactly. Okay. Student illness, uh, trips, uh, anything falls under that. Uh, category. Okay. Yeah. I read something that uh, the student attendance is directly related to the student's performance or their achievement towards uh, graduating high school and going further into college. Do you 
have any comments on that? Or? Yeah, there's some definite uh, uh, well-vetted studies that do show the positive correlation between attendance and grades and uh, achievement for sure. Um, the uh, uh, and when we can see it just in our schools, just anecdotally every day, you know, students who attend more tend to do better in school. The as we work through a root cause analysis of our current uh, growth data when it comes to our students and and just basic achievement data, we're, we're definitely narrowing in on uh, attendance on being not necessarily a root cause, but definitely a serious impact on how well our, our students are doing post COVID uh, for sure. So again, it's gonna be an area that we're gonna really focus on improving. You bet. All right, next slide. Just a quick little bit about student learning. That picture that you see up there, I'm not sure if, um, I'm sure last year you heard a little bit about our district guiding coalition. So if you remember, we are working with Solution Tree again this year, and they are the group that's helping us develop a professional learning community culture in the district. Um, the guiding coalition is all of the principals, uh, uh, teaching and learning staff from the district level, myself, uh, representatives from the Monroe Education Association. We are meeting regularly with Solution Tree and they're providing training for us. And Jesse, if you wouldn't mind hit the next one. Um, this is our revised purpose statement as far as the guiding coalition that just simply states, we are going to work uh, on developing a collaborative culture focused on the continuous improvement of instructional practices and student outcomes. Uh, we commit to inspire and support our staff through our use of clear and aligned structures and systems rooted in data analysis. Uh, the solution tree, that is, this is what they're helping us try to, ac to accomplish. Um, that core guiding coalition group, we also have a teacher leader from every one of our schools that it's like an expanded guiding coalition that they're helping us before we make any big uh, instructional moves or professional development moves, et cetera. Uh, we have input from each one of our schools to help us uh, uh, make those decisions. Uh, go ahead and hit the other, the rest of those. That'd be great. What the solution trees going to help us do is answer those four critical questions of student learning that you have heard about. So as a system, if we can answer what do we want all students to learn, how will we know they've learned it through our assessment systems? What are we going to do if they haven't learned it? And then how will we deepen the understanding of those students who have already learned it? That will absolutely ensure high, higher levels of learning for all of our students. As a system, October 13th, that's a non-student day, our K-5 instructors are going to land on what's essential for mathematics. We haven't done that as a, as a district. We've operated a little bit more like a district of schools in this respect. The five elementary schools, independent of one another, have gone through processes to determine what's most important at our school. Uh, the issue, as you can imagine, is when students move from school to school, uh, there's different areas of emphasis, depending on what school you're at as a third grader in the Monroe School District. So the goal will be to determine what's essential for all third graders to know and be able to do when it comes to math. The reason we have to narrow it down, and you've probably seen these studies or heard these studies over the year, there's too many standards. There's far too many standards. We would need kids to be in school 15, 16, 17 years for us to truly cover every standard that's required of us. So this is a pretty natural and normal process for school districts to go through. Um, we will be doing that for every course and every content area K-12 over time. And that's what Solution Tree is gonna help, help us work through those processes. In a perfect world, uh, we would also be moving, once we figure this out for K-5, uh, we, we would potentially consider moving uh, towards a standards-based report card. So those things that we deemed essentials for our students to know and be able to do, parents would be getting feedback as to how, they, how are they doing on those standards as well. So uh, more to come there. We have a long ways to go, but we're, we're uh, uh, taking one step at a time. Um, let's see. Oh. Uh, 612, what they're doing on the 13th, they have um, Dr. Shiraki Hollies coming in. He'll be with coming back for uh, part two with our, with our uh, teachers. And it's really all about uh, culturally responsive uh, instructional practice. So, the, so that's happening this Friday.
Next one, Jess. All right, so uh, here's another metric that, we'll, that we will be tracking. Um, certainly in all of the focus groups that I've done and interacting with students and staff and family members, uh, certainly there's concern around how, how do our students feel about coming to school? Do they feel like they belong? Do they feel like they're welcome? Um, if you can uh, look at the picture up there, those are students at uh, Park Place Middle School and they are part of the student leadership team. And they went into every classroom during connections and they were doing an activity around having every, all, of, all of the students in the school create a poster with welcoming language uh, and they could pick whatever language th that they wanted to welcome other students in. And the idea was these students through their voice, uh, they were recognizing uh, the wonderful diversity we have at Park Place uh, Middle School. And they were celebrating the differences and talking about how great it is that we have all these different languages that are spoken, um, using our students to lead that uh, charge. And uh, they did a fantastic job with that. Um, that alone, probably felt really good. It felt good for the school climate, uh, but but it's a series of things like this that will impact the culture of the schools, right? So as a system, we have, you'll see in, in a couple of weeks, um, we, we want to be very transparent about our kids, how our kids are feeling today. We have assessment data, or not assessment data, but survey data that would suggest we have some room to grow. Uh, we're, um, uh, below the national norm when it comes to our students feeling fulfilling a, a strong sense of belonging. Um, we've identified that as a growth area. And each year we're going to uh, set a new goal and we're going to make some movements, but we're not going to depend on our schools to operate independent of one another. We need to make some systems level changes. Uh, so it's not dependent on whether or not a principal is going to do a certain activity. Our, our, principals are dialed in, they're excited to make some uh, moves here as a system. And, and I think it's important that we report back regularly to y'all here. Now, we're going to talk a lot about climate and culture in our district and in our schools. And, and a lot of people use those words, as you know, interchangeably. But here in the district, we'll, we'll define co culture as beliefs, practices, behaviors, norms. What is the personality of the school? I like that. And then school climate, how does it feel in the school? Uh, uh, what's the feeling that either encourages students and teachers to engage in the school, love the school and want to be a part of it, or to reject the school and disengage from it? Um, and really, the, the climate is impacted by the culture, right? So uh, an, uh, an easy way to put it, climate, how we feel, and culture, how we behave. Um, we will be attending to, to these things, and, and we'll keep you posted. Next slide, Jess. Sean, real quick, before you move on, the, uh, well, it's part of the belonging. You had some of the panorama data that we were originally going to look at last meeting. When are we going to have a chance to look at that as well? That was some of the data. Two we weeks. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, great question. So two weeks, we will do um, an attendance snapshot historically, then our, our, um, our, our first uh, data point when it comes to sense of belonging, and we'll be able to compare that up against national averages, et cetera. So one of the things that that we're working on is, yes, increasing a feeling of belonging so all of our kids feel like they belong, of course, um, and also decreasing the uh, incidences of harassment, intimidation, and bullying. Of course, I heard a lot about that coming in. A lot of it you shared with me, and you have we've had lots of conversations one-on-one -on -one about this. Um, there has been a tremendous amount of movement in the last year. Right before I got here, a lot of great things were happening to address these issues in the Monroe School District. The problem is we need to do a better job of making sure our families know this. So um, our district uh, leadership team met and we were, were discussing how, how to do that moving forward. Uh, we will be, within the next couple of weeks, sending some communication out to our family specifically on this topic, and it will outline, okay, what does reporting even look like when it comes to if something happens, if, if a child is being harassed, intimidated, or bullied, uh, how does a student report that? How do parents report it? We're going to talk about our, our vector system, so our parents know how to engage with the technology that we have. Um, we're also going to uh, work through how do we respond as a system um, what does an investigation look like? What happens when someone makes a vector report? 
uh, it's taken very seriously. Uh, I can tell you that because I've, I've, I've looked at it and I've watched the investigations and I've been, it's been outlined to me as a system. We just need to make sure that every time we investigate these things the same way, we, we respond the same way and we want to expect different results out of, out of those kids when we engage in, in those investigations and those dialogues and, and we're working with the families. Um, I've talked to a handful of families and I think families will appreciate knowing, okay, this, this is how, how it's dealt with. Um, there definitely is uh, some mistrust right now that we need to regain that trust and, and uh, we're probably going to over communicate. I don't know that you can over communicate in these areas, but we have some work to do there. Um, I was uh, thrilled to see that I was walking through Maltby Elementary School last week and you can't see the picture very well up there, but there was a learning target in the back and it said, I can recognize when someone is being bullied and I can report bullying to my family and teachers. So I asked, well, what's going on with this? This is fantastic. And kids are writing about bullying and what would they do if they're on the playground and they saw something happen. And um, last week is, was uh, anti-bullying week for the entire uh, elementary, all five of our schools. So what does that mean? They're front loading every year with our uh, second step curriculum that is, is the anti-bullying piece. There's a series of lessons that this is just what we do K-5 uh, again through second step. Um, and I, I'll definitely make sure I send you an outline of, of, of what does that curriculum look like? And have you, have you had a presentation on that yet? The uh, second step, you, you, I think you'd probably uh, enjoy that. Uh, so that's something that happens. Uh, it's, it's, I don't think it was front loaded last school year, but it's front loaded this school year. So that's just building capacity, uh, for our students and, and how, how, how do we be part of the solution for this, right? The, um, 612, I'll circle back. I, and, and I don't mind sharing cause I can, I get to use the I'm new card still. Um, I'm not sure how it's handled as far as the training component of this 612, but I will get back to you at the next meeting and, and share that piece out. And finally, um, not finally, but the last piece, you might be thinking finally, but I want to talk to you a little bit about Christian Page. Uh, Christian Page came last year and worked with students at Monroe High School. Y'all are familiar with a little of uh, uh, Christian's work. Christian came back and worked with our entire staff. That was my first opportunity to see all the staff in one room. And Christian was uh, with us for a day. And he was really focusing on this notion of increasing student voice, right? So utilizing our students to help us create more welcoming environments for, for our kids. And it was absolutely fabulous. So it's a strategy that we're going to utilize moving forward, trying to figure out how do we capitalize on our kids and their voice to help us solve some of the challenging things that we face. Um, kids will tell you, these two young ladies, they know what's going on in their respective schools, right? And they probably have great ideas as to how to um, approach some of the problems that we face. So uh, that's something that I'm looking forward to bringing back as we solidify what we're going to do as a system with student voice. Um, we have a lot of principals that are really energized with this that are doing things in their specific buildings. But again, we have to continue to look at these things as an entire system, let our principals do their thing, but also make sure that all kids are benefiting from, from good work in these areas. All of these things obviously are also things that are gonna uh, help our students achieve better and learn at higher rates and, and, and those kinds of things. So I think next steps for us is just to make sure that we're really solidly communicating these two things to, to, our, to our families. Um, oh, with that last little thing, I'm looking forward to um, next week, I believe, I can't remember what the group's called, but uh, I think Kim started this when she was the acting superintendent, Kim Whitworth, but there's, I get to start at my first, uh, I think it's student advisory committee, superintendent's advisory committee. Yeah, so that starts next week. So it's my first opportunity to meet with a group of students and really dig in with them and have them help us um, capitalize on student voice. So that's the, 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 the first topic. So 
um, I'm sure I'll learn a lot and I'll bring that back to you all. So that's all I have for tonight. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Sean. That was great. That was a lot about students and all the good things that are happening in our district. Thank you. Okay, moving on to agenda item 8.01, board reports and or comments. Director Campbell? Now that? Okay, thank you. Director Barnes? Director Whitfield? I don't know. It's positive. But you need to have something negative. That's what we've been advised. What was really fun over the weekend <clears throat> on Friday night, watch the Bearcats just cream the Mount Lake Terrace was 35 to 10. Looking at all the parents and uh, all the activity, all the volunteers. And then the following morning, I saw another junior Bearcat team the eighth and ninth graders, and they got creamed by Lake Stevens, zero to 40. But my granddaughter was on the cheerleader squad, and so we were there for her. And it was so funny that uh, there were just a group of parents that were there for the cheer. The, uh, the kids, they were just getting creamed. <laughs> We'd watch them once in a while. But anytime there was uh, an outstanding cheer or a good routine, everybody was clapping. And it was just funny seeing the difference between those little little kids playing and the big kids and they they each came through the you know crashing through the paper or something like that um but it was fun watching and it was just interesting what looking at looking at that age and then the high school age um just really enjoyed it thank you director whitfield okay it is, October is National Principal Appreciation Month. Yay. <laughs> I would like to express my gratitude or we would like to express our gratitude to the incredible principals who lead our schools each and every day. To all the principals in our school district, thank you. Thank you so much for your steady commitment to our students' growth and well-being. Your leadership truly makes a difference and we're grateful to have you as the leaders of our schools. I would like to read, well, Director Campbell is going to help me. He is going to read off each of these remarkable individuals by name and the school they lead. So I wanna say thank you to the following administrators. Hugo Molina, Frank Wagner Elementary, our principal there. Deb Henderson, who is the assistant principal and currently serving as an interim principal. Bonnie McKerney, Frank Wagner Elementary interim assistant principal, who's helping Deb, who's filling in for Hugo. Melanie Gray, who is our principal at Salem Woods, Christine Hillstead, who is our principal at Malby Elementary, Jeff Presley, who is our principal at Frylands Elementary, Dan Hermes, who is our assistant principal at Frylands Elementary, Anna Apter, who is our principal at Chain Lake Elementary, AJ Adamski, who is our assistant principal part-time at Chain Lake, part-time at Salem Woods. We have a lot of logistics going on here. Uh, Brett Willie, who is just with us, who's our Bearcat principal at Monroe High School. Um, Rachel uh, Blinkley Bailey, who's our Monroe High School Assistant Principal, Teresa Van Vandervart, who is our Monroe High School Assistant Principal, Noah Wallace, who is another one of our Monroe High School Assistant Principals, Charles James, who's awesome, and he is one of our assistant, uh, our interim assistant principal, uh, Karen Rosecrans, who is our amazing Sky Valley Education Principal, Alexandra uh, Pex Clark, who is our Sky Valley Education Center Assistant Principal. Going on to the next page. Christy Hilson, who is our Park Place Middle School Principal. Joel Garrison, who is our Park Place, one of our Park Place Middle School Assistant Principals. Tanya Brink, who is one of our other Park Place Middle School Assistant Principals. Jonathan Judy, who is our Hidden River Middle School Principal. Patty Skirtsky, who is our Hidden River Middle School uh, and slash Maltby Elementary Assistant Principal. And Tina Vinick, who is our Leaders uh, in Learning High School Principal. We got a lot of principals and they do a lot of work. And some of them are going back and forth between different buildings and they love kids. I want to point something out also. The vast majority of our principals and our APs have stayed with us through some very turbulent times. Thank you. 
all of our and all of our building head building principles have stayed with, with us through very difficult times. And that just shows for me, like they got grit and they care about our kids and they care about their staff and they care about their families. So thank you. Thank you. And I wanted to remind everyone of the strategic plan community input sessions. Uh, they are next week, October 17th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. at Hidden River and October 19th, 2023 from 6 to 7.30 p.m. at Monroe High School. Uh, we love community input and I encourage you all to sign up or is there a registration? No, nope, just show up show up ready to share and partner with us in making Monroe um, even better uh, so that we can continue to support all students. And um, that is all. Oh, I, I was able, I took my kids, if you are free on next Sunday, I forgot what movie I was playing. So my, I'm sorry. But on this upcoming Sunday, uh, Galaxy has partnered with uh, Monroe Equity Community to put on a series uh, of movies and we watched Selena with my kids. And I sang along and my nine-year-old daughter got upset with me and uh, told me to stop. Yeah, I, my job is to sing and dance and celebrate, but it was really neat. Uh, and then there's another movie next Sunday um, it's free if you have, you know, a free Sunday. And um, it is 5.55 p.m. Tonight's meeting is adjourned. Thank you.